Hey everybody, I'm Yvonne Williams with Back to Earth Creations and in this video I'm going to show y'all how we made these uh, antler and crystal or ammonite fossil or just antler pendants. So I'll be showing you how to sculpt and apply some different finishes as well as how to wire wrap. So let's go ahead and get started. In a previous live stream, I had made these three pieces. I, I actually made these two, but hadn't painted um, or dry brushed them yet. And then in the, like there'll be links down in the video description to the live stream. Uh, and it's like in the like second hour of the stream that we were working on these. But on this one, uh, this is what I'm gonna be showing you how to make though the same exact techniques apply for if you're adding a quartz crystal to the top of the antler. And you can see this is really like loud noises, but like this is heckin' on there. <laughs> like so um hopefully future Vaughn goes in and quiets that down a little bit. But I wanted to show you guys how seriously durable this is. Now the product that I'm using or products rather are epoxy sculpt. And this is a two-part compound that does not require baking, which is great to use if you want to attach pieces of resin or different things like that onto um, your antler. Uh, it's also, you can sand it, as always, with anything that's making a fine particulate dust. Be sure to wear a respirator. It's just good for you. Um, and then these antler pieces in particular were gifted to me from a Secret Santa, actually. So thank you, Secret Santa. I think you know who you are, hopefully. Um, but they are available on Amazon, and there are links to all of our tools and materials down in the video description, as well as on our website in our curated toolkit. Links for all that stuff's down below, too. So I've picked out an ammonite and a bit of antler that I kind of thought they'd look pretty sweet together. Kind of positioned like that, I think is how I'm gonna do this. Now you could use seashells, you could use, I mean, literally anything, anything that you wanna attach to the top because you don't have to bake this. Now, um, we're gonna start with this one and then do the finishing touches on these other pieces since the epoxy sculpt is already cured. Now, I do recommend using either niotrile or latex gloves, just something to keep the chemical off of your hands, especially if you have sensitive skin like how I do. Um, just better safe than sorry. Now, you could weigh this stuff out and be very, very like careful and particular with it. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so I just pull off lumps, uh, follow their instructions though, but I figure if you guys do it even as haphazardly as I do, um, I still get good results. So, but you want your lumps to be about the same size. Now this epoxy sculpt I have been working on for like a long time. So it's a little discolored and weird looking. That was just some separation, but it's still, it, you know, when you saw me slam it on the table, it works just fine. So even if it looks funny, you can still use it. Okay, so those lumps are about the same size. And I'm gonna come through here and just kind of smush and fold and smush. And you can roll it and fold and smush. It will start to kind of soften up as you work with it. Now, it has a one to three hour working time, um, which I, I still like to just mix up what I think I'm going to use at a time, though. You can always mix up a little bit more, but you can't unmix it. And I also try to have other projects on hand that just in case I have a little bit extra, um, I, I can utilize it. But yeah, so it starts to become a really nice uniform color whenever it's thoroughly mixed. It's also at this point is when it is its stickiest, which is when I like to apply it to the um, pieces that I'm putting together. Now I have gone through with some like 60 grit, 60 or 80 grit sandpaper uh, outside with a respirator on. I kind of sanded down some pokey bits of the antler that just in case they poked through would be uncomfortable against your skin. Though this can also be done after um, the epoxy sculpt has cured 
um, all of it is sandable. So if you have like any like little pokey bits or anything, um, you can kind of shape that. So uh, this stuff builds on itself really well. So I like to tear off just a little bit. And I am doing this in real time with y'all because I want you to get a very realistic perspective of you know how long it takes to make projects yeah sometimes whenever you're making a piece it's not just about the budget for materials but it's also about the time budget too and uh, I just want to I'm not one of those uh, five minute craft channels it's like oh yeah you just do this it's like no I'm going to show you guys how to when you when you finish watching this video I want you to be able to make it just like how I did if not hopefully better with your own spins of creativity like, I'm not going to be vague or anything. Hopefully. Hopefully it won't be vague. Ooh, and this one, gosh, that's such a nice, on the back side there. I really like that, the opalescence. Oh, and I hate to cover that, too. Drat. Well, maybe we could just... Okay, so on this piece, the back side didn't have any of that really cool color shifting. Um, but on this one, I'm going to do it just a little different. And I don't want to cover up any of the cool ammonite fossil on the front, but we may come through. And I'm just rolling this out. Uh, if you've worked with polymer clay or anything like that, a lot of the techniques overlap, though it is not quite so malleable as polymer clays and I would never put this through my pasta machine or anything like that it's a little too sticky that and it, it really sticks pretty well to whatever you are attaching it to so I've just come through doing a little bit of an edging on this piece because I want to leave that back side open because I think that's just beautiful. Now also, while I am going to be working with just the epoxy sculpt in this tutorial, in the past I have and do still use um, this epoxy sculpt to make the bases for electroformed pieces. It covers really well with um, graphite or copper conductive paint and holds up exceptionally well through the acidic electroforming bath too so that's always pretty neat so now i'm coming through with just this ball stylus tool making sure it's nice and clean and i'm just going to get the tip of it a little wet and you can press in and add some different texture and things i'm being very repetitive here at first, but then we can come through and kind of mix it up a little bit. I'll be mixing it up with a different size tool. But right now I just want to get all my fingerprints out of it, all the little, you know, kind of creases from where the folds and things were. And at this point you could etch in, like, you could add any designs that you want. You could use metal stamps to add designs like leaves and things or um, leather stamping tools work really well now the only thing we have to watch out with this is it is going to be inclined to getting smushed out of shape um, at least until the epoxy sculpt has cured so just be mindful. Especially with a piece like this that is so three-dimensional. Um, like it's not, there's no like perfectly flat plane for you to uh, prop it against. Also, I apologize if I'm quiet. Um, I think something's up with the audio recording on my phone, but I'm doing my best, so. <laughs> Turn your uh, volume up if I'm too quiet. Also, I'm just rambling anyhow. 
I'm just coming through with this dotting tool. Now also, something that you can do is after this has cured, and the use of water actually kind of softens the appearance of the details that you're adding as well, which sometimes that can be something that you're looking for and sometimes that's something you want to avoid. So uh, just, again, being mindful. So I'm just going to come in and press that down. But after the epoxy sculpt has cured, and I actually like to use this tool rack to set the antlers in. That way it can cure without uh, getting smushed or knocked over or the cat knocking it off the table, hopefully. But so with the rest of this epoxy sculpt that we have here, this has already cured. And I'd like to come through and at this point, I think it'll be all right to work without my gloves on. But again, you make that call for yourself. And I'm just going to kind of try to make a nice little round of the epoxy sculpt. And I'm going to apply this and I want to, I thought I was going to have it be just a round ball. Um, whenever you're applying, like, for this guy, I think I'd really have liked to have a bunch of like little round balls, like make it look like they're growing off of it. It would have been a good idea for me to make those uh, accent pieces out of epoxy sculpt yesterday or like six to eight hours ago so it could be nice and hardened up and then press the hardened balls into the soft epoxy sculpt. That way they maintain their shape but still make a good connection. Whereas you can see here, um, by smooshing it, I distort the shape of what I'm doing. But we can kind of just test stuff out. Or you could have a cured base and cured accent pieces and then use a bit of epoxy sculpt as the adhesive to kind of smush it onto there. I don't know if I want to do little nubs or if I want to do little spirals or little dots. I don't know, let's do some little dots. And with it having a one to three hour work time, it certainly does give you enough time to experiment. So I'm just going to make a little dot, oops, and press that on there, like so. And then I have this little style of this uh, rubber tipped tool. I'm going to dip it in just a bit of water and then press in the center like that. And I think that makes a really nice little detail. So I'm going to come through and try to make a bunch of little round dots I'm going to show you what I'm doing and then complete this in time lapse that way you know, after a certain point you get the idea <laughs> I do like to place them one at a time and add that dimple as I go, because I personally think that gives it like a really nice effect. Or you could place them all and then go through and add the dots, but I've always personally gotten better results. Whoops, with this method. Oh no, oh no, oh no. Oh, it, it fell, okay. <laughs> oh, this is a disaster. Now, also, if you kind of get this going and let it cure, and after they've cured, if stuff's just fallen off left and right, glue is your best friend. You can get all of this stuff kind of reapplied back together. Let me see if I can't find. Are you lost for every little thing? Where'd you go? Probably had a bunch of dog fur in there. Oh, I stepped on it, actually. Okay. Um, so I'm going to continue doing this, but in a time lapse, and I'm going to do that to both of these pieces because I would really like that effect to be going on, so.
Okay, so this is how this guy's come along. And I think I'm just gonna be a little minimal with it. I like that. And I'm gonna set him off to the side to cure. And I found this little crystal in the stash of rocks and things. And Randy and I, um, and our niece Maddie, mined up a bunch of crystals, like just a mess of them, down in Mount Ida, Arkansas at Ron Coleman Mine. And this is one of the teeny tiny little points that I had found just laying in the in the kind of driveway walkway. So I'm going to, I think, hmm, let's see if we can get that to fit. But I'd kind of like to set a little crystal, um, just like boop, right in there. And I'm just going to position and try, yeah, I think that's how I like it. And I am going to press it in a little bit. Let's get really nice surface contact. And now I'm going to come through. You can see I've made a whole mess. Um, I've used up the rest of my epoxy sculpt that I'd mixed to make these little nodules. And I'm going to pick my biggest ones first and begin by placing those. Just kind of pressing and then bloop, do in the middle like that. Oh, and there's a little bit of dog fur in it. I don't mean to get the sniffles in your ear, but it's pretty cold in here and I have the heater turned off so I can record so it's getting colder even still. So I do apologize though. So I'm just going to bring that in and smush. So let's see, maybe zooming in. If I stay in frame, might be kind of cool. But yeah, I I really I feel like that balances it out a little bit more. <clears throat> so I'm gonna put a couple of small nodes. Let's see, see if I can't drop that in there. Yep, just like that, and get a little bit of water onto the tip of my tool, and just press that in. Yeah. I like it. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I kind of want to just fill in some of that negative space between the two because that's going to give us a little bit more solid of a contact. So just dropping the little node and coming in and just using the tool. Now that one I got a little bit of a split on it. Sometimes using water on the tool tip isn't enough. Sometimes you also need to work with the node a little bit, like the little ball of clay, to warm it up some and that makes it makes it more supple. Even though it's going through its curing time, it still, still makes it more supple. So that's just some water pulled there in the tip, but that'll be fine. Just sorting through here. I just trimmed my fingernails, so I'm not quite able to pick them up as tactfully or as I would have liked. So there we are, kind of building up that shape. And from here, we get to decide how much more we want to build this up. I think it'd be pretty cool to do, like, just little clusters. Like, um, sometimes doing clusters of texture can actually be a lot more effective than completely covering the whole surface. So by doing, like, a, a large, medium, and small node in different sections, kind of grouped together can give you some really nice detail and coverage and kind of blending in between. We can also go through with our tool and just do some little spots to make it kind of look like it's tapered off naturally or something. <laughs> Though I am also a really big fan of just adding 
more little bumpy things and I can hear my cat stomping up and down the stairs. Hey, Fred. Okay. I'm going to do another node right there. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. And so now we could continue to add nodes across the top if we want, but I kind of like maybe just doing some dotting. doesn't have to be perfect. I actually very much prefer, um, though I'm not a beginner crafter, I'm still not very, like, meticulous, and my hearts are all, my heart, my hearts, um, my heart is always with beginners, and for me, it was easier instead of striving for geometric perfection and, you know, the ultimate symmetry and all of these things, to just do kind of a messy, organic look, and just let it be what it is, without stressing myself out about you know whether or not the piece looks like how I felt like it was supposed to look it is better I think whenever a person's just starting out or if you have tendencies to be very hard on yourself to just love it for what it is um because even if it's not your favorite thing if you give it as a gift to someone or sell it in like if you have a website or a shop or something it may be the most absolutely perfect and beautiful thing to somebody else so just be kind and patient with yourself and the piece and just do your thing and uh yeah <laughs> and also there's there's always the next piece so there's always more crafting to be done if you don't feel like you nailed it this time well there's always next time but there are a few things that I've seen put a damper in folks' creativity more than um, perfectionism or <clears throat> maybe obsessing a little too much over, well, it was supposed to look like this. And it's like, well, it doesn't, but it's still gorgeous. Like, this is not at all what I had planned. <laughs> so hopefully it still comes out well. So I've zoomed out a bit. I think this is going I think this is it this makes me happy I don't know I kind of want some <laughs> and welcome to the creative process of thinking you're done but you're not actually done and then thinking you're done maybe you should have been done but there can be a fine balance sometimes uh learning when to not overwork a piece still eludes me okay so yeah, I think, I think I like that. I feel as though I've neglected the back, but I don't want to do too much onto the back side and risk, because that's where it's going to be going against clothing and all sorts of stuff. So, but I really like the way that these two join together. There's still a little bit of separation right here, but not so much that I feel like it's going to get snagged and rip the crystal off if you're wearing like a knitted scarf or something. I don't know, as soon as I say that, I've never in my life had anything be secure enough, so I'm just going to... I hear you, kitten! It's raining outside, so my little Cali cat's indoors. So Ember Cat is very distressed. Okay, so I've added just another little node right there. I like it. I like that a lot. Well, yeah! It's hard being a cat all day, isn't it? With no sympathy from anyone. Okay, <laughs> so I'll talk to my cat later. So now, again, I'm gonna take this and I'm just going to set it here in our tool. Ooh, I need a bigger, there we go. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I actually have to take some of my tools out just to be able to fit, but we got it in there. Okay, I also have a piece here that's a very beautiful amethyst point that was sent to me very generously by y'all um, that I've just put a little bit of a cap onto because my intent is to wire wrap this, but having this cap here gives me something that I can 
wire wrap against that will keep the wire from sliding off. So sometimes, actually quite frequently, I will use epoxy sculpt to just make a little bit of a stabilization point on undrilled stones. That way I can still wire wrap it without, you know, having to turn to lapidary work. So now the next step is going to be um, some choices in finishing. So before I set this guy off to the side, let me fix this little node so that it dries in the correct shape, or cures rather, I think is the right term. So this one we made in the live stream, and I had dipped my gloved finger into some water and like blended out the epoxy sculpt and tried to get it very smooth and then used another slice of antler to do a little bit of texturing on it but then I didn't finish it beyond that I waited for it to dry and then I painted it with just a matte black um, acrylic paint like I've got a big old jug of this stuff I use it for just about everything um, but then this one I actually think I preferred the result that I got on this so I'm going to show you how I did that and to do this we have this is carbon black Prolex powder. Uh, I've seen folks use eyeshadow, which can work in a pinch, but I've found it isn't as, it doesn't last as well. Like, um, sometimes the colors don't stay true over the years, but you do you. If all you've got is eyeshadow, use it. Don't let, don't let something stop you from crafting. But while the epoxy sculpt is still a little tacky, we can come through here. And I'm just dry brushing a bit on and I'm actually going to let y'all go for a sec I'm gonna go into time-lapse because I'm gonna have my respirator on because you don't want to mess about with these uh, particulates y'all but um I'm gonna get that on and then uh, meet you guys back here whenever we've gotten the base color down Alrighty, so here you can see, um, <clears throat> if you've watched that bit we've just done, I put on most of the Prolex powder with a brush, but you can also get a really nice effect by dipping your finger into the Prolex. Again, use discretion, this may agitate your skin. Um, and you can kind of pat and burnish it into the surface of the epoxy sculpt. Now you don't want to be too heavy-handed with it, um, with the application rather. Just because it may distort some of your details. But I really like how that came out. And after this is all dried and everything, um, we would move on to our next step. Which let me set that over in our stand to cure. Our next step would be, this is how it looks after one coat of the Prolex, and then I let it um, cure completely. And I have dry brushed it just a little with some acrylic paint, which the way that I do that is here I have some scrap paper towel, and I've got my little stiff bristled brush. Oh, and we've got blurry. There we are. And I'm going to get just a small bit of paint onto my brush, a completely dry brush. And then you can see whenever I tap it out, it's depositing less and less pigment. And I'm just going to come through and going perpendicular to the texture that we had put in here. So the texture lines are going this way. I realize it's black and that doesn't necessarily... Uh, show the best contrast um, but I'm just kind of coming through and so the texture is going this way so I'm doing my brush this way 
and I actually think this would show up a lot better, I'm going to do a little bit of like an antique copper metallic highlight on this. So let me go grab that paint and I'll be right back. So here we have some folk art antique copper. And again, just patting the tip. And I've mixed this with just a little bit of the black that was already in my brush. And you want to apply very minimally because you can always add more. And so here you can see it's kind of grabbing just those high points. On the antler. Now if this is something that I wanted to go through and electroform, all the area that you can see here that's painted black, I would have painted with um, some sort of conductive paint, whether it's graphite or whether it's um, like actual copper conductive paint or just what have you. Um, and I would have covered the rest of what I'm working with in liquid latex, just like how you can get it like uh, during Halloween time for like prosthetics or even multiple layers of like Elmer's glue, but I do prefer the latex to it. Um, but Elmer's glue has worked for me in a pinch, so I'm just coming through, sweeping side to side. And so hopefully you can see a little bit how that brings out some of those high points. And I'm actually going to travel that down a little bit further, catching the detail on the antler, because I think that uh, blurs the boundary between what was epoxy sculpt and what was natural antler, though I don't think my sculpting job was good enough for anyone to be, I mean, truly convinced, but if it looks cool, then you did it right. <laughs> now you could do this with Prolex pigment as well, but I do kind of prefer just using the paint. It binds really nicely to the epoxy sculpt and then I'm going to show you all how I go through and finish these. I don't seal the bone, I feel like it needs to breathe to do its thing, but I do seal over where I want the paint to stay. And so that's you can see the difference between the flat black and the burnished or the um, highlighted antique copper. So I'm going to come through as well over here. Just brushing very, very lightly, depositing just as little bit of pigment as I possibly can. Just trying to catch over the surface of the um, where I've painted. Again, trying to blend the line between materials. I especially like how this shows off the, uh, the uh, that little bit of texturing that we had done. Which, let me see if I can't... Whoa! Mess about with the brightness. There we are! <laughs> Sorry, I'm just a professional YouTuber. <laughs> like... It's not like I know what I'm doing or anything, because I don't. Someone send help. Like, <laughs> but uh, trying to make it so you can see a little bit better. I guess I could have messed about with that in post, but honestly, I don't know how to do that. So here we are. But yeah. I kind of like that. And of course, if copper is not your favorite thing, you could use silver tones, you could use gold, you could use uh, a metallic blue. Like, you don't have to just stick to base metal colors. Like, I, I cannot emphasize enough whenever y'all are following along with our tutorials. Um, do what makes you happy. <laughs> um, like, it, like if, um, if I'm not using your favorite color, then make it in your favorite color. Like, uh, the techniques often always uh, apply. So whether you're using copper or purple, the technique is the same. So now that we've done this, we're going to let that dry. I'm going to let you guys go for just a bit, but through the magic of editing, I'll be right back with dry paint and a cleaned brush. So the way that I like to seal these 
is with Mod Podge Hard Coat. I find it holds up phenomenally. And I've stirred the bottle because, hey puppy, sorry the dogs are clip clopping through the house. Um, I've done two coats already on this piece and I'm going to come through and do a third. Now it goes on white like this but it does dry clear and I do like to kind of feather it down the length of the antler just to make sure that I've secured on the um, the paint. I'm not so worried about on this design the paint holding up perfectly but if you put you know details and all sorts of things like you want to preserve that. And so just trying to get nice even coverage because if you do multiple thinner coats it's going to dry much faster than if you did one super globby coat. So that's, that's how I do that and then I just let it dry and then it's done. So well <laughs> and by done I mean it is now ready, I'm just rinsing my brush out, it's now ready for us to wire wrap. Which if you want you could have designed it right from the get-go that just like a wire or something would go through it. You could whenever you're positioning everything be mindful of if you want to drill it or drill through the antler. But I wanted to wire wrap these and so what I'm using here is 18 gauge and this is bare copper wire from parawire.com. And I'm grabbing let me assemble a few tools real quick. So I'm going to be wrapping today with this 18 gauge wire, but I would recommend anywhere from a 20 to 16 gauge. 20 gauge is a little bit thinner than this, 16 is a little thicker. Um, I don't know if I'd recommend going any thinner than a 20 gauge unless you really like uh, double it up, you know, on the, um, and, and that'll make more sense here in a sec. So I'm going to pull off about, oh, 15 to 20 inches of this wire and I'm just using flush cutters which are flat on one side just wire snips round nose pliers and then if you have mandrel pliers I really like these or you could use the handle of a paintbrush or a pen or just whatever you have but I'm going to be using the smallest tip size on my mandrel pliers to make some loops so kind of figure out what we're doing here. I would like this to be the front. I really like that flat plane on the crystal and just the way that the horn shapes or the antler is shaped. So I want to come around on the back side and about here and here I'm going to make two loops. So I'm just going to grab hold with my mandrel pliers and bend around once. And this is where if you were using like a 22 or a 24 gauge, I would recommend doing multiple rotations instead of just two, like like four to eight rotations. Um, and I want to be stacking the wire next to itself, <clears throat> just like that. And this is more or less in the center of what we're doing. And so I'm going to come off into the other direction. And I'd like to build the wire up in the same way. So how, if this is our flat line, the wire is building away from me. So I want to stack it away from me on the other side as well. And the width that we're looking for is we want to be able to comfortably fit the, the widest point of our pendant between the two loops that we make. So I'm going to take that using the same size mandrel and wrapping around like this. And now you can see this is the baseline of our wire is between my working wire and me. That's going to make sure that our wire stays on the same side. And truly that's not that important. It's just a detail that I pay attention to and I figure um, if you are trying to replicate what I'm doing exactly that might be useful information to you. Okay, so now we have two coils on each side. 
You could if you wanted to have strung some beads there. Just, you know. Whatever. And these loops here are going to be what I attach the chain or cord of this pendant to. So I now want to hold our wire like this and I'm just going to bend away like that and I'm going to flip it over. How did I do that just now? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so I'm holding the loops like that and just bending up. And this is going to allow us to wrap around our, our crystal and antler. Okay, so I'm just going to come around to the front here. And you can see that's rounded them in just a little bit, but I don't mind. And pressing with my thumb, round about in the center, I've bent up with one side. And then I'm going to press with my thumb on the other side and bend down. And you can see this is kind of making a little bit of a knot. And I'm going to continue... cinching and tightening that down. Until it makes a little bit of a rosette, like that. And you can see that didn't really hug as tight as what I wanted. So, and I, I truly am winging this because every single piece is different. So what we're going to do is we have this rosette <clears throat> and I'm going to bring our wires the rest of the way around and then with both of the wires I'm going to wrap around just around the back side of our antler until they come to the front. And you can see that's starting to hold things a little bit more stable and secure. But I'm going to continue, and I want them to be more friendly with each other. Oh, well, there's a train. <laughs> so I'm just going to wrap them around like that. And now you can see it's hardly wobbling at all. So we can tighten this down a little bit more. But this wire, I probably should have given myself a little bit more to work with. I apologize for the train, but <laughs> the neighborhood does not operate on my schedule, so <laughs> on my recording schedule, so <clears throat> that's all right. And so I'm going to bend this around like that. Let me zoom in a bit for you. There we are. And now from here, I'm going to snip. Oh, oh, that went across the room. And gripping right there like that, I'm going to bend around. And you can practice with scrap wire or fresh wire or whatever, um, making little spirals and bends and stuff. <clears throat> and now you can see this, this wants to shift around a little bit on us so we can position it a little bit more. Just smushing the heck out of it to get it to sit nice and snug against the antler, but now very, very little um, wiggling and I'm going to come through just using the tips of my pliers maybe the camera will focus maybe and I'm just going to press well that didn't do much anything did it all right then well <laughs> maybe if we grab here and here Ooh, well that just separated it out don't be afraid to experiment y'all there's no real messing something up. It can all be per, uh, repaired or modified or finagled with. So I'm going to kind of, there we go, getting my pliers in there and doing that little bit of a bend, cinched that down the way that I want. And to do that same thing on the other side, I'm just grabbing like this. And... No, that's kind of bending it the other way. Let's try the other way. Oh yeah, I like that. Cool. Well, now it's all upside and weird. Just like me, that works.
who says your chain has to go out at the same direction from both sides. So now we have a little wire wrapped antler. Now you may not like that these guys here are just laying about and that's okay. Uh, we could have come through and used some 26 or 28 gauge to kind of weave everything together, but I wanted to keep this very beginner friendly, and I have sold a lot of jewelry over the years done in this style, and it holds up pretty well. Now, something if you're having a lot of issues with it snagging, you could take another little piece of that epoxy sculpt and smush it kind of over and in. You could use some different epoxies like um, that are more liquidy and kind of put it on there. You could even use a little bit of the Mod Podge and get like, cause it does behave like a glue too. But I mostly find myself just coming through and pressing and shaping the copper down to the antler. And I find for the most part that works really well. So, Again, if this isn't your style, uh, you can wrap it however you like, but now we do have something that can connect shoulder to shoulder. Uh, like, I don't know, I kind of visualize them as little like pendant people, so if that's the head and that's their feet, these are their shoulders, and the chain could go off in either direction. You could make chain mail or leather cord or macrame, just whatever you like. And there we are. Hey guys, thanks so much for hanging out with me in this video. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas, please leave them down below. Um, if you enjoy our free tutorials and would like to support the creation of more of them, as well as participate in our exclusive behind the scenes uh, access and weekend streams and I don't know, just <laughs> all the stuff that we're doing here at Back to Earth Creations, we also have a mess of like coupons and stuff. I don't know. We try to, we try to make it pretty fun for y'all and um, it's as low as a dollar a month or $12 a year, and uh, the more you pledge, the more you get. So we also do monthly subscription kits as well, so you can craft along with us and use our artwork in your artwork. So um, be sure to check out all the links down in the video description below, and until next time, y'all, happy crafting. Bye! <laughs>